Hi, I'm Scott Hahn, and I want to welcome you to the Road to Emmaus, a podcast from the St. Paul Center. Today, I'm excited because we have a special guest, Professor Nina Hirman, who is the author of a brand new book that has been released from Emmaus Road, entitled A Thirst for the Spirit, Biblical Wisdom for Desert Times. Now, if you've been following the Road to Emmaus podcast, you might remember Professor Nina Hiraman from a couple of years ago that we were discussing her doctoral research and her dissertation that was published. But before we even touch upon that, first of all, I just want to welcome you, Nina. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, Dr. Han, for having me. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Well, let me just state the obvious, and that is we have brought you into town from, well, St. Patrick's Seminary in Menlo Park, where you're a professor of Scripture and Theology, but more recently from Milwaukee, where you've given a retreat to the seminarians, over 70 seminarians up there at St. Francis Seminary in Milwaukee. And so since landing, I think you hit the ground running and we have worked you hard. And so we're coming close to the final lap, but I just want to thank you for allowing us to, you know, you gave a talk last night on campus to our students. You'll be doing a show for the university tomorrow as well. But now at last we get you in the St. Paul Center studios for this podcast. And so, uh, I want to ask you, what is the background for this book, A Thirst for the Spirit, Biblical Wisdom for Desert Times? Well, the background is part of it. You inviting me to come to Stoneville to give two conferences two summers ago when we had the topic of life in the desert. I don't exactly remember the topic. I think you had chosen the Gospel of Mark, but you didn't tell us. You just gave us a verse from the scripture, from the Gospel of Mark, and we understood we should meditate on what it means to live in journey in the desert. And that triggered in me a memory of a beautiful retreat I'd done on the book of Exodus and how, on the one hand, we are called to recognize ourselves in Moses, each and every every one of us being called through our baptism to be a priest, a prophet, and a king, and see in the life of Moses, and particularly what many people don't pay attention to, the first four chapters, the way that God prepares him for his future mission. That was one topic I picked up to just meditate on my own life in the light, in the mirror or light of how God formed Moses for his future mission and flesh that out a little bit for the audience two years ago during an applied biblical studies conference. And then the second topic that I'd always wanted to deepen was to read the the journey of Israel through the desert as God's um, manual, God's own spiritual writing as an instruction for our spiritual life, how to attack life in a desert, which as the fathers teach us, basically those 40 years of Israel in the desert are just the typological image for our life between baptism and death entry into heaven, right? And so to recognize how God guides us through the desert and which are the traps that Israel falls into. And we, hopefully, studying and meditating the scriptures well, will not fall into if we know what the temptation is. That was the subject of your lecture last night. Yes. It's chapter 4, 12 Rules for Life in the Desert. That presentation and this particular chapter makes the book itself, I mean, it just, that is, whatever chapter I happen to be reading is probably my favorite at the time. But this one last night is what I needed. And then I talked to my coworkers. We all needed this talk because we're all going through desert times, not just because of Lent. I mean, that's what made it so specially timely. But I think the cultural upheavals of the last three years, since 2020, since whatever you want to call the reset, you know, this woke and cancel culture and critical theory and whatnot, uh, I, I think we've sort of lost our bearings. And yet, at the same time, the Lord hasn't. And so the message of hope is sorely needed in troubled times and arguably more now than at any point in my own adult life experience. Wow. That is a powerful statement. Yeah. And I don't think it's even slightly exaggerated. You know, I just want to touch upon a few of the steps in this particular chapter. The first one is leave Egypt. Explain that. <laughs> okay, that was very personal because, I mean, obviously, in order to reach the promised land, you have to take a decision to leave Egypt. And it's something that, you know, in the modern parlance in the church, we've kind of lost the grace to preach conversion. I mean, think when you last encountered a homily where you were really challenged to convert. And yet, if you look at the gospel, the first words that our Lord Jesus Christ preaches 
are not hello <laughs> so nice right. to be with you no his very first words are repent for the kingdom of god is at hand and if you know literal liter, literary analysis as well as you do do you know that the first words that the evangelists um uh Quote of the Lord, the first words you, as a preacher, you speak, they're going to be the program right. of your... You're setting in- the agenda. Exactly. It's like when Pope Benedict came into office, you know, uh, remember John Paul II, open the doors for Christ. Like, he sets your agenda, the main topic of what you want to do in your pontificate. So here's the Lord Jesus himself. And what is his very first word? Repent, because the kingdom of God is at hand. So in order to enter the kingdom of God... We need the grace of the Holy Spirit to examine our lives and realize where am I still living in Egypt? Right. So people hear that and they say, okay, check. I've done that. What's next? Well, well, <laughs> you know, the fact is it's not just the first utterance of our Lord, repent and believe. It is also the, con- it's the continuous emphasis. And I was thinking of the road to Emmaus because there's a call to repentance in the sense of metanoia, a, a complete and total change of mind, the way you think about everything. You know, here Clopas and his companion meeting up with an apparent stranger, and after sharing their brokenness, their their sadness, you know, you'd think he'd offer some comfort and consolation. He says, "Oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary? What is he doing? He's calling them to repent. Exactly. But I mean, they're not novices. They've been following Jesus presumably for the last few years." And yet that does not mean that you've checked it off your list. It's one and done. It's over and done in the past. Repentance is something ongoing because so is conversion. Exactly. And this is the mistake we often make that we say, oh, I converted in the year 1998. No, I started to convert in 1998. And hopefully I'm still striving to convert every single day. One of the things you bring out in this book in different ways and in different chapters, but especially chapter four in the 12 rules for life in the desert, is that... um, when you have that conversion grace and you make the move out of Egypt, you often experience a sort of a, a honeymoon period with the Lord. And those graces, those consolations accompany you and they give you a false sense of like momentum. It's downhill from here. I've gotten out of my life in the past. And yet at the same time, it's not true. In fact, what, do you, what would you say to that? Well, I think you just touched on an extremely important point. Um, I remember I was my spiritual director explaining that to me in the beginning of my conversion, that when he was explaining to us the initial steps or the organic development of a life in prayer, and God in his goodness lets us experience the this enormous sense of liberation when we first leave the world. And it's, it's, even, it's not even... A, um, an extra grace he gives us, it's natural that when we are delivered from the clutches of Satan, delivered from mortal sin, we would feel this huge relief and joy in us. Then as we go into the desert, he accompanies us with his consoling graces to encourage us, to keep us going. But the mistake we might make then is to think, oh, I'm already perfect. And I, so like I say in that talk, you mistake that grace of consolation for being already in the seventh mansion of the interior castle. And then the Lord slowly, slowly takes away this consolation in order to strengthen us. And as I say in the book, to to, um, purify our love, to to make it chaster, because um, we all are, because of original sin, we are born selfish. And all we look for in life is in is in favor to serve our own egos and self, right? Right. And so the grace we really need is to be transformed so as to become truly capable of loving and loving the beloved more than myself. And the more I'll be able to love the beloved, the more, of course, I am loving myself because it's the best thing I can do for myself to love him. But in order to be um, capacitated uh, to love him, the Lord needs to purify us. And this is when then this desert experience comes in because it really makes our own life more chaste. And that's what we want. Right. And so as we start off on the spiritual journey as beginners, we haven't reached the second stage of the proficient, the illuminated. We haven't reached the stage of the perfective, you know, the unitive. And so we've got to adjust our expectations and slow down and pace ourselves because it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. 
but you show it's even more than a marathon. It's like 40 years in the desert. In my case, it's slightly over 50 years since my conversion at the age of 14. And so I'm like, okay, 40 years are up, and yet I'm still struggling, you know, in, in every area with my own weaknesses and that sort of thing. Another point that you make is be ready for a detour. Mm-hmm. What is that about? <laughs> well, that is very striking, right? Because as soon as the Lord gets them out of Egypt, you would he, the Bible says he did not lead them the straight way, but took them on a detour for fear that they would return when faced with the, battling the Philistines, right. uh, the Egyptians, sorry. And so that really touched me to see that even though there would have been the straightest way to the Red Sea, the Lord takes them on a detour because he knows battling the Egyptians directly would be too hard for them. Right. So if I translate that to my own life, if I think of the battles that someone like St. Padre Pio had to undergo, thanks be to God, he I don't have a Padre Pio devo- uh, um, vocation because he is someone who had to, like the Lord himself, go straight into the desert and fight Satan himself in the headquarters. But us who are weaker... He wants his people to reach the destination. And so he only uh, guides us in according to our capacity of battle, of getting stronger in the desert. And I found this so consoling because if you if you just said, oh, here I am more than 40 years into my conversion and I'm still working on this and this and that. Um, so often when we look back on our lives, it seems like, oh, this is going so slowly. And why did I end up? in this or that place. I remember during my doctorate, I got huge obstacles thrown my way. And I was like, oh, I was hoping to be out here in four years. But then it ended up being six years. In hindsight, I I can see that these obstacles were put there in my human eyes by my quote-unquote enemies. In hindsight, I see the Lord allowed this detour because it allowed me two more years in the Holy Land. And without those two years, also, I would not have ended up in San Francisco, but in a place where I didn't really want to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's hindsight that's twenty twenty, but it's divine providence. Exactly. That he, he never gives us a map of what his plan is for our life. And yet he gives us a map of what Israel journeyed through to show us, get ready for detours. Mm-hmm. You know, and since you brought up Padre Pio, uh, in the last 10 years or so, he's become one of my favorites. When I went out to Italy and I spent about an hour alone in front of his tomb that's opened, you know, I uh, struck up a conversation that became something of a friendship because I was already complaining after 40 years of trying to really become a saint how hard it was. And then on that pilgrimage, I discovered, you know, St. Francis is the first to be given the marks of Christ, the stigmata. And then, of course, in the Franciscan tradition, this Capuchin, Padre Pio, was given the stigmata for 50 years. Wow. And it just, it hit me like a, a thunderclap. It, for 50 years, you bore the wounds of Christ, and you did not want to put them on display. You tried to hide them, but the whole church could see how Christ was living out the passion of his love through your priesthood, and he was a feisty soul. Mm-hmm. I mean, he had rough edges and, and he didn't pretend to be something, you know, sanctimonious like some kind of plaster saint, a statue. And and I, I have put a statue of his right where I do my morning prayer on the other side of the fireplace, St. Joseph, because, you know, both of them have had trips to Egypt and out again, you know. And life is so much full. It's, it's fuller of detours than when you're staying on the main course. It's sort of like Ohio roads in the summertime where they're always under construction. We're the ones under construction. The third step is know in faith that the Lord is with you. This was one of the most consoling sections last night in your presentation. How much you sum that up? Know in faith that the Lord is with you. Well, I would sum it up that we forget that when the Lord shows us Israel traveling through the desert with the clouds over their head, right, protecting them against the scorching sun by day and the pillar by fire, in the pillar of fire by night. That's not just a story about Israel 3,000 years ago. He's giving us an incarnate symbol, image, for the reality of the life of a child of God, a baptized Christian who is now on his way towards the promised land. And God is always at our side. The cloud, symbol for the Holy Spirit, protecting us against the scorching sun, and in the night, this is 
you know, of course, typically another symbol for our life, we are in the night. Right. And we got one light, and that is Jesus Christ. But he's with us through the Holy Spirit. So even though we often don't see that cloud, you know, when the cloud is over you in the desert, you don't even see the sun. Right. So it's kind of dark, and you don't know where you're going. But that is God's divine protection. And that same Holy Spirit, the Lord being with us through the Holy Spirit, is the light to our feet guiding us through the darkness of this night. And I think we often forget that this is the deepest truth that God has promised to us from the moment of our baptism that he is with us. It's who he is. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. And then in the New Testament terms, he is Emmanuel. God is with us. And Jesus promises in Matthew 28, 20, I will be with you till the ends of the earth. And we're just so blind to that fact. We sure are. You know, you cite that passage, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And I heard it last night in terms of, behold, Scott, I am with you always, even as you reach old age. I'm not there yet. <laughs> but on the other hand, I feel that, that, um, that weakness that sets in when change used to be much easier to bring about. Um, and you use the analogy, but not in the book. You just alluded to it a moment ago. And this is what occurred to me last night when I was listening to your presentation along with all of our students, that uh, the pillar of fire, oh boy, that's a comfort at night and the pillar of cloud by day. So you always kind of know your direction and the, and the glory of the Lord is, is surrounding you. But more often than not, it feels as though there's a sun, but we can't see it because of the clouds. And along with the clouds come the storms. And it's easy to kind of forget that behind it all, there's still a sun and it's shining bright. And even at night when you couldn't possibly see the sun, you have the stars, but you also have dawn coming. Mm -hmm. And so the Lord has inscribed into creation all of these gentle reminders that I am with you, but not the way that you're always pouting and demanding like a brat. You know, I, I can get that way. And you also said something like, you know, in the past, Lord, you have always provided for me. You know, but right now, you, you talked about coming to Rome. Tell us that story about yeah, okay. that laptop. So um, when during the time of my initial vocation, there was, a um, you know, Matthew 6 touched me really deeply. And the Lord saying, um, uh, look at the lilies in the field, how beautifully they are dressed and uh, the birds don't collect. And yet, oh, your heavenly father cares for them. And I don't know why the Lord really gave me this grace to desire to live on his providence. And so when I first had my vocation, I just graduated from law school. I'd done my bar exam. And the, God gave, the Lord gave me the grace to just trust that um, if I sought first the kingdom of God, he would take care of my financial needs. Of course, this I owe to the beautiful example of many, many French communities who just lived on that word of God. So I, I, for many, many years, I had the experience of the Lord telling me, go and study. And out of nowhere, the money would come to pray, pay for my apartment and university, etc. just living on divine providence. But um, kind of only five years into this uh, experience, I moved from Frankfurt to Rome and I had just arrived in Rome and I literally knew nobody, but I had the address of a friend of a friend in case I needed some directions. But he said to me, um, she's a very dear friend of mine, so be careful. Um, don't take any advantage of her. So I arrive in Rome, I get my apartment and someone gave me a Motorino. So I put my computer on the Motorino, never having had a Motorino in my life. You know, I don't like know. Like a, a moped scooter. or yeah, yeah. motor scooter. And of course, in Rome's streets with all these cobblestone, oh. duk -duk -duk -duk, after the first ride, my computer was broken. So I stand there, first day of the university, and no more computer. And that's, and that's as a student, that's your basically, heart, exactly, your mind. Yes. Exactly, the only thing you need as a student. So I remember standing there and saying, Lord, I know you've taken care of me all these years and in the minutest details, but I think this is asking a bit much. Like, where, And I didn't have a penny, right? Where? I, I'm sorry, but I can't believe that you would be able to provide me with a new computer in this situation. I'm sorry, I, I don't even have the faith. Um, so, but I apologize for my lack of faith. <laughs> I may, I put it into words. So then I decided to go and see this friend of my friends. And I go into her office and I said, could you tell me where to find a repair shop? And my only worry was like, how can I pay for this repair? And she said, no, I'm sorry. I don't know any repair shop for a computer. And then she paused for a moment and she opened her drawer and she said, but you know, I bought this macbook a while ago and i don't need it have it it was a brand new macbook pro 
And it served me all the way to the time at the Greg and then the Biblicum. There I was. <laughs> and you mentioned that when you stepped out of her office, <laughs> you teared up. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Help thou my unbelief. In Mark's gospel, I think ought to be a daily prayer for people like us because you have such a, an accumulated number of encounters with our Lord. You would think that it would just be second nature. And uh, sometimes it is. But those times that kind of come up unexpected remind you that, you know, it almost feels as though I'm back to square one. I, I've got to get back to the basics of, of trusting you, that you are present. Now, we're not going to have the time to go through all 12. Besides, if we did, people might be unmotivated to get the book. <laughs> but when you get the book, you're going to find out not only the 12 rules for life in the desert, but all these other essays that I have enjoyed so much, including one of them, I will make a helper suited to him, the pneumatological vocation of Eve. This was the subject matter of the conversation that you and I had at least a year or two ago on this podcast where we were talking about uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe and, again, uh, Matthias Shaban and the insight into the ineffable union of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Holy Spirit. And, again, unfortunately, I must apologize because our viewers were like, get into that. Well, we can't. But you can if you get the book. I will make a helper suited to him. Uh, I have now gone through this, I think, four times. I find more every time. It's so clear. It's so deep. And yet at the same time, it's pointing to the future of Catholic theology. We've barely begun to understand what St. Jose Maria called the great unknown, the Holy Spirit, wind, fire, dove. But what is the visage? What is the person that would follow from father and son? And the Blessed Virgin Mary becomes almost something of an icon, yes. as Colby would say, the quasi-incarnatus. And then he, he, he qualifies that carefully. But there are other, your study of Queen Esther as well, that I found really illuminating. I could go on and on, but let me just say, again, by way of a summary description, that uh, this book is much needed. Uh, our mutual friend, uh, Mary Healy, says that Haramon's book displays a rare combination of careful exegesis and profound spiritual insight. Readers will be amazed at the depth and richness of biblical revelation, especially regarding the exalted vocation of women. Every page contains new and surprising gems of insight. And you've got other endorsements from, you know, uh, Father Anthony Giambroni, our dear friend, uh, and Ted Sri, and Dr. Gary Anderson, the Old Testament scholar at Notre Dame. Um, but this should be enough to motivate our, our, our viewers and our listeners to, uh, to track down the book for themselves. They can go to stpaulcenter.com and see the, uh, the link for Emmaus Road. But um, I would also suggest to our audience that uh, delve into uh, Professor Herrmann's background. Uh, at the risk of embarrassing you, uh, you shared last night that in your mid-20s, you as a German baroness were on the verge of engagement to a young man, finishing up law school, preparing to study for the bar exam in Germany. I had just finished it. Yeah. You had just was, finished. Yeah, the bar exam, yeah. Yeah, and so then you opened yourself up to the Holy Spirit in Rome in 98 for the Feast of Pentecost, where I happen to be along with you and about a million other people. And the rest of your itinerary, talk about detours, but I mean, talk about the amazing providential guidance of God and filling you with the Holy Spirit and giving you an opportunity to study under the Jesuits at the Biblicum in Rome. That's a very demanding program. And then to finish a doctorate at the Ecole Biblique under the Dominicans in Jerusalem. And when we have our next episode, I'd like to talk a little bit more about this amazing project that you had the opportunity to do for your doctorate in six years, not four, because I, I really believe that this is going to represent something of a breakthrough in the way that the church reads and understands the Song of Songs, the Holy of Holies there in the Old Testament uh, for generations to come. And it's a rare grace. It's, a, it's an unusual gift to be given an opportunity to find something really new in something so ancient as sacred scripture and something so deep and mystical. But I, I believe that what you have done is um, groundbreaking, but also um, uh, life-changing for individuals as well as for the church. And so let me wrap up this particular episode of 
the road to Emmaus by thanking you, Nina, for the opportunity to have this conversation among many others this week while we're really making the most of the time that we have with you. And uh, let's just conclude in a word of prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of Jesus who accompanies us on this Lenten journey in the pilgrimage of life, which is so much like Lent. We ask you now to give to us that joy that will come through the Paschal mystery, that we will set our eyes upon your Son and allow his Spirit to fill us with hope, with joy, and with humility and love. For we ask all of these things through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. All right, amen. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Road to Emmaus. Until next time, may the Lord richly bless you.